Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As you know, by this time, Women of Reform Judaism is honoring several remarkable women during our upcoming Women's Empowerment Awards event on May 13th. And every week, we're releasing a video about one of our honorees to highlight their achievements and to engage them in conversation here on Facebook Live. So you can see Julia Weinstein, who is our honoree this week. I also want to thank Natalie Bowles, who is assisting with our technology today. Now, Julia, we've had the, the pleasure of knowing each other for many years through Women of Reform Judaism. And I have always, always been impressed with your thoughtful leadership, which spans advocacy and social justice, marketing and communications, and to my delight and many others, the application of technology. You are uh, often our go-to person for help with what's new in the land of tech. But what you've done is you've brought your professional expertise to WRJ. Many of our women, I think, don't know that you came to us with litigation experience as a lawyer, and you generously share that with WRJ and all of your expertise with so many women. So this first question should be an easy one. What does women's empowerment mean to you and to your career and life's work? Thank you, Blair, for that introduction. I treasure our friendship and all of my time in WRJ. And I wanna thank WRJ too for this award. I'm very, very honored by this recognition. Um, when I think of women's empowerment, I think of a woman who is self-confident, has belief in herself because she knows she can decide how she wants to live her life. And she has choices. She has opportunities. She can have the power and the right to choose her own path and be her true self in every area, in education, in work, in society, and in her personal life, over her body, as well as economically and politically. Um, in my own life and career, I was exposed to the concept of women's empowerment at a super early age. And then as a teenager, I chose to go to Wellesley College which was and still is an all women's college. At Wellesley, the entire campus was filled with female role models and peers. And we competed with each other on a level playing field. We could be ourselves. We were the leaders on the campus. And we never questioned whether a qualified woman could or should do a job or could realize her dreams. And I found the same thing in WRJ. WRJ is a place where women are the leaders, we run the show, and we can reach our potential. I think I mentioned that after I graduated from Wellesley, I mentioned to you yesterday, I was sometimes asked, how can you compete with men not having gone to, a col to college with them? And my answer was, I compete with men the same way I compete with women as equals. And I always felt this worldview, this self-confidence gave me an advantage, especially when I became an attorney and what was then a very male dominated field. I think we've come a long way now, but I remember when certain private clubs did not admit, admit women as members. And when I was part of a trial team in New York City and later in Los Angeles, and I was usually the only woman, there were plenty of times when we would meet at a private club for a lunch meeting. And on those occasions, we'd have to eat in the ladies dining room. Women were not allowed anywhere else on the premises. And the first time that happened, I was dumbstruck. I had never heard of such a thing. And a good thing it is that that kind of thing has changed today. Well, let, let me ask a follow-up. I'm going off script now a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you were to run into that today, how would you handle it? You know, when you're in that kind of situation, it depends on whether you are subordinate to the people in your cohort or whether you're an equal. If I'm with peers, if we're all at the same level in the hierarchy of the meeting or organization, I would say, let's go somewhere else. That's how I would handle that today. Um, there are other places to go. You didn't have to go to that place. Um, however, when you're, when you're a subordinate, there are all these pressures. You, you have to think about how you're going to be received. And, you know, honestly, sometimes women take the path of least resistance. I can't fault that. But if you could suggest, let's go somewhere else. 
it, even if they decide not to, you've made your statement. I think that would be a good way to ha handle it. I, I love that the making your statement, whether or not people get it, it's, it's silence that I, I think is problematic. And as we've discussed, I, I uh, started my career as an engineer, a woman engineer back in the late 70s. So uh, there weren't that many of us around then and had similar experiences to, to what you had. So fortunately, we don't run into that uh, much these days. So next question, Julia, what is one of your proudest moments lifting the voices of others who may not have a platform to do that for themselves? I think I am proudest of my work as the WRJ Amicus Brief representative. I began that work when I became vice president of advocacy for WRJ and I continue doing that thankfully to this day. It allows me to use my legal training in a way that really fills my heart. And, um, and it does, it, it benefits everybody. It's in this role, let me explain. I decide which briefs WRJ should sign on to because WRJ advocates in cases in state and federal courts, including in the US Supreme Court. We're a part of a coalition of like-minded groups, for example, a coalition of religious groups of all denominations that are asked to weigh in sometimes as friends of the court on cases involving religious freedom. And we're part of women's rights groups that are sometimes approached to weigh in as friends of the court um, in cases involving reproductive rights and other issues involving women. In these cases, we're invited to sign on to briefs where we have a strong interest and where we can, as a friend of the court who is not a party to the case, present information and arguments that is not already before the court. How powerful is it in a case involving, for example, um, a coach who requires uh, the team to pray on the field after every game? How powerful is it for a religious organization, along with many other religious organizations, to sign a brief saying that's not okay. So um, that that is the kind of case that we can show the court that its decision will impact people other than the parties before it, people who don't otherwise have a voice in the proceedings. And we do this in all kinds of cases, cases involving reproductive health and rights. There've been a lot of those lately, as we all know religious freedom, such as the case I just mentioned, civil rights, human rights, immigration and refugee rights, gun violence prevention, so many other issues. And each case is different and unique. It presents an opportunity for us to advocate, I feel, for social justice directly when the law is actually being applied in a real life situation. And, and I love this work. And it shows and having, um having seen and observed and participated in that process with you. It's, it's really, it's so important to the work WRJ does and you personally have brought so much to it, but I think it's clear um, your commitment in it, in the commitment to it. And also the breadth of issues that you have dealt with lifting the voices of those who might not be able to do it for themselves. So I, I want to thank you for that on behalf of uh, WRJ and everyone who you've helped. Uh, now you've kind of touched on this, but let's ask it specifically. Can you talk about a time when Jewish values, specifically Jewish values, informed and influenced your work and how do you think Jewish values and empowering others intersect? Jewish values are at the center of all of my work as the WRJ amicus brief representative. And they were also the foundation of all the work I did when I was WRJ's vice president of advocacy. WRJ takes positions on issues by resolutions and statements that are voted on by our members. And each resolution or statement is based on Jewish values and cites relevant Jewish text. You can go online at wrj.org and find a list of our resolutions and statements. And when you read them, you will see that every issue, whether it's immigration, whether it's uh, 
uh, healthcare, every single issue, whether it's education, um, has has a foundation that is based on Jewish values. You can find a Jewish value. Um, I was looking back at some of the, the statements that we wrote, and we wrote a statement years ago on um, Justice Merrick Garland's nomination, or at that time, the nomination of Merrick Garland to the Supreme Court and hearings were not being held and the board issued a statement saying we need to issue, we need to have hearings and you will see Jewish text that's relevant, that supports the position we took in that. So all of our policy decisions are under, under scored by our Jewish values. Now, empowerment and Jewish values, I think just goes hand in hand. Um, Jewish values teach people how to live, how to treat the world, how to treat others. And when we advocate for social justice, we live and express our Jewish values. And I might add, we advocate for justice for all, regardless of religion. So these Jewish values are allow us to support people of every um, ilk of every kind. And what is social justice, though? It's empowerment, it's equal rights and equal, equal opportunity for all at all levels of decision making, economic, political, social. So social justice is empowerment and social justice is at the heart of our Jewish values. So I see it all as one big pot. I, I don't think anyone could have explained that any better. And I, I will reiterate for those interested at WRJ.org, which Julia mentioned, um, the resolutions and statements, which go back actually now over a hundred years are accessible online. And, and, it, and it gives you a sense of what was going on in society uh, throughout uh, that history. So. It's fascinating reading, and there's a wealth of information there if you're inclined to do any research on any individual topic. And Julia, I know you spent a good bit of time going through that, uh, that I, history. I want to say that the very first resolution that WRJ ever did, which was just a few years after we were founded in 1913, was on immigration and whether there should be a literacy requirement. And when I think back, had there been a literacy requirement, my grandparents would not have come into this country because neither of them had had formal schooling. And, um, you know, those kinds of issues impact future generations and, and everyone in the country. And ironically, we faced them again, you know, in 2016, we had, you know, in the recent years, we are, have faced some resistance to immigration and changes in policy and the same issues keep coming up over and over again. Yeah, it's amazing when you go back and look, go ahead. We were at the forefront though. We were, <laughs> we often, issues. often, yes. yeah. All right, Julia, last question for you. What piece of advice can you give to women who are still fighting to be heard? I think we're all still fighting to be heard. Um, thinking back to my own life, when I joined my first law firm as a young associate, it was a big law firm in New York with hundreds of lawyers. There was only one female partner at the time, and we've come a long way. Women are breaking the glass ceiling in every field, and young people today are living in a very different world. They don't encounter the barriers that we did, I think, and they have wonderful role models at the top in every field but we still have a long way to go in valuing and treating women as equals. We saw that in Justice Katanji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearings. And we have to work twice as hard as less competent men to succeed. And we have to be better and we have to jump higher. And that applies doubly to women of color. But that all said, there are some strategies that I think we can adopt. First, I would say that to be heard, women have to be mindful of the context and the setting in which they're in. For example, corporate business and even educational settings are still really patriarchal and have these male bias social norms. And we've even adopted, internalized these same social norms. When we look at someone and view them as empowered or powerful, it's often through that same male bias lens. You know. The, the deeper voice, the, 
the more serious demeanor and all that. So how women present themselves in these settings can make a huge difference in how they're heard. Um, I was aware, very aware of this in a male dominated field and I know you were as well um, in your field. And I joke that I felt like a hockey player preparing to body check an offensive player when I would enter some settings and meetings or depositions. And I actually, I, I have this, this tick here, I actually felt my shoulders and upper body tense, just like a hockey player's would. And this was not a bad thing. I think this image actually made me feel empowered. I was still a woman, I was still feminine, I was true to myself, but I knew that I was strong and empowered. So if you see me going like this, you know that I'm feeling power. But I wanna be perceived as a woman who has her act together and who can get the job done, whatever it is. So my advice to women who wanna be heard and taken seriously is to be aware of the setting and the context, and then to make sure you present yourself accordingly. I suggest you always be prepared, present with self-confidence, body language is important. There are lots of tips on the internet, but you can convey power in some settings by you know, leaning back in your chair and others by leaning in when you speak. There are lots of tips, having your arms on the table and spreading out and claiming the space around you. And I'm not talking about man spreading um, as Hillary did about Putin, <laughs> but um, be aware too that people will say, for example, women should not smile too much. I hate to admit it, but I agree to, to an extent that in some work settings, there's a time to smile and a time not to smile but you have to be true to yourself. Feminists out there are probably bristling. Men don't get called out for these kinds of things. And it's ridiculous and unfair to call out women for smiling. But if we're fighting injustice and inequality, there's this period where the pendulum swings past center before equilibrium is reached. And we aren't at equilibrium yet. So I would say maybe don't smile as much, act like you belong in the room, that you deserve to be there and that you earned it. And the last thing is we need more women in the room and at the table that's already happening. Once they're there, support other women, mentor them and sponsor them. And I think that will make a huge inroad in achieving true equality and empowerment. Absolutely. And some interesting advice, and I'm now going to have a permanent mental image of Julia coming in with her hockey gear on, ready to body check, but, but sometimes we need those kind of devices to help ourselves remember to do those things. Mm -hmm. So thanks for, thanks for sharing that, Julia. And also, um, I think it's obvious from this conversation what an inspiration you are to so many of us and why you are deserving of this Women's Empowerment Award. So thank you for everything that you do. Keep it up um, and thank you for sharing and thank all of you uh, for joining us today. We'll be back next week with another one of our honorees, Ronnie Cook Zulki. And you can still register for the Women's Empowerment Awards on May 13th. Go to our website, wrj.org, and you'll find it on the homepage. Once again, Julia, congratulations uh, to the unseen Natalie Bowles. Thank you so much for providing our tech support and for everyone wishing you all a Zissen Pesach.